Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome back to Depictions Media Radio. I am your host, Michael Cloggs. And in British Columbia on Wednesday, January 19th, which is tomorrow, uh, the Coquihalla Highway, Highway 5, will reopen to regular traffic between Hope and Merritt. This will be a very different um, route. Um, there will be areas um, where... There will be no passing. There, uh, there will be. There's still because the highway is still under repair, uh, um, according to the minister. Um, and we need to be be very careful and be very mindful of how we are looking after the person directly behind the person driving in front of you. Um, but. This will bring some convenience to the route uh, for people who need to travel between the lower mainland and the interior. It will significantly um, reduce travel times. So uh, with that, let's listen to what um, is actually said in the press conference and how Highway 5 is actually coming along. Any reporters who'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. With that, I will hand it over to Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, Rob Fleming. Good morning. I'm grateful to be joining you from the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And uh, today I'm going to be providing an update on some of the most heavily damaged highways from the November storm events, specifically uh, Highway 1 through the Fraser Canyon, Highway 5, the Coquihalla, Highway 8 connecting Merritt and Spence's Bridge, and I'll touch upon Highway 99 as well. I first want to begin uh, with a discussion around the current state of emergency uh, in British Columbia. This will expire at midnight tonight. It had remained in place while we monitored the Coquihalla after it reopened to essential traffic, which was primarily commercial vehicles. And of course, that highway was reopened to essential traffic on December 20th after tremendous efforts by our road crews and by BC road, BC's road builders. Since then, we've been able to monitor uh, the traffic flow and the repaired highway, and it has performed very well. We have had, of course, some weather-related uh, issues with a strong winter of heavy snow events. Uh, however, the areas where temporary repairs are in place are functioning well. We're now in a position to safely open the Coquihalla to regular vehicle traffic, and that will happen beginning tomorrow. This will be a much more convenient route for people going to and from the lower mainland to the interior, and it represents another significant milestone in our recovery from the devastating storms. Uh, with that, though, drivers must be aware that this is not the Coquihalla as we know it. Uh, there are some changes. Electrical, electric vehicle charging stations remain out of service due to damage from the storms, and some rest areas are closed. Uh, some sections of the Coquihalla are two-lane traffic only, with one lane in each direction, and multiple speed reductions are in place. For everyone's safety, it's imperative that all motorists obey the posted speed limits and do not pass in these sections. The drive between Hope and Merritt will take approximately 45 minutes longer than normal, so people will need to be patient and budget that into their travel time. Safety for motorists is paramount. To, to that end, there will, be continue, uh, there will continue to be rather increased enforcement from the RCMP and Commercial Vehicle Safety Enforcement, CBSC, on this route to ensure that drivers are being safe and that they're driving to the winter conditions. The Coquihalla, as we all know, is a steep mountainous route, and we've seen how conditions can change quickly with severe winter weather. People should only be on the highway if their vehicle have uh, good winter tires, a full tank of gas, and they have food and water 
and warm winter clothes with them. As with all travel in the winter, people should check Drive BC before they leave because delays or closures can happen on short notice. I'm going to move now to Highway 99. Uh, also tomorrow, Wednesday, we'll be removing the weight restriction on Highway 99 between Lillooet and Pemberton. Uh, this means that larger commercial vehicles will be allowed on the highway as they were before the November storms. Uh, this is going to be very helpful for truckers who need to move goods within the local area. Uh, however, because of the steep and winding terrain uh, that is part of Highway 99, it is not a preferred corridor for heavy commercial uh, vehicles and should only be used for local commercial traffic. Moving to Highway 1 Fraser Canyon, we've had good progress on Highway 1 through the Fraser Canyon. Uh, despite what we've encountered with uh, high snowfall and cold temperatures over the past few weeks. Last week on Thursday, we opened a portion of Highway 1, the stretch between Kanaka Bar and just south of Lytton and Spence's Bridge. Uh, significant work from our amazing highway crews has now been completed in that section. Uh, at Tank Hill, a temporary detour, including an at-grade rail crossing, is built uh, where a landslide sheared off about 70 meters of the highway and damage the railway above it. At the Nickerman Bridge, a single lane temporary bridge is installed upstream of the existing damaged bridge and at the Gladwin culvert site, new culverts are installed and it is restored to two lanes of paved highway. Weather has been impacting work on the last remaining section through the Fraser Canyon, which is between Boothroyd and Kanaka Bar. But crews are back in there now. The avalanche danger has subsided and at Jackass Mountain, we have a single lane 260 foot temporary bridge being installed where a large section of the two lane road was completely wiped out. Um, because this long single lane bridge, uh, which is in a known avalanche zone, uh, when this section opens, drivers will have a pilot car service here for about four kilometers. We are confident uh, in the ministry that we can get that section open by the end of January. And this again will open up another route connecting the lower mainland with the interior and the north and will further help the province with the movement of people and goods. Uh, similar to the Coquihalla though, when the Highway uh, 1 does fully reopen, it will not be as it was. There will be lengthy delays with additional travel times of up to two hours or more and load lengths restricted to uh, 25 meters. This is due to continued construction activity. We will have crews when we reopen those sections, we will have sections of single alternating uh, traffic and at uh, grade rail crossing. So trains will uh, be, uh, be crossing while motorists wait and, um, and we will have ongoing avalanche control. So those are the caveats of the progress on Highway 1, but it is amazing work and we thank everybody who has been involved in, in, in that uh, over many difficult weeks and months now. Um, let me move to Highway 8. I wanna give an update on Highway 8, specifically between Merritt and Spence's Bridge, which of course was largely destroyed. 23 separate sites are being addressed on this stretch of Highway 8. Uh, temporary access has either been completed or is under construction now at 10 sites with construction set to begin at 13 more sites in the near future. Access through the five sites between Merritt and the west side of Shack and Indian Reserve is now open for local residents. Uh, work is progressing well at Spence's Bridge, uh, the end of the Spence's Bridge end of Highway 8, uh, with local access established over Kernu Bridge. Repairs are ongoing at Rattlesnake and Three Mile Bridges right now. Uh, BC Hydro has restored power to residents between Merritt and Shacken on the north side, with work continuing to fully restore power throughout the area. All of this means that we expect to have temporary repairs on Highway 8. Uh, to a point where people can regain access to their homes this spring. It's important uh, when we're talking about Highway 8 uh, to note how important Indigenous and local leaders are in helping guide these important repairs and we're in regular contact with local residents. The three Indigenous joint venture contractors are working with the maintenance contractor to complete this work on Highway 8 and First Nations cultural and archaeological monitors are working at all locations under construction. We would like to thank the local residents for their advice, for their patience, for their cooperation, uh, and First Nations uh, communities and leadership for their assistance with this ongoing work. We'll continue to communicate directly with people in the area, with Indigenous governments and local governments uh, as this timeline firms up. 
I want to speak briefly because I promised an update before uh, Christmas and holiday break about the costs of emergency repairs that the province has incurred. Uh, the work to reopen all of the damaged highways has truly been impressive and we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the crews and staff who put in the long hours and all kinds of conditions to make that happen. We don't yet have final costs of the emergency repairs to our highway network as one can understand and we won't have final confirmed numbers for another couple of months but I can say that the early estimates are in the range of 170 to 220 million dollars. This work covers uh, work on both the south coast and in the interior, all of the areas impacted by the series of extreme weather events. Uh, of that figure, approximately 45 to 55 million dollars are expenses that were incurred to reopen the Coquihalla. Uh, the estimates include all the work that were needed to reopen highways, such as repairing bridges and roadways that were washed out, uh, removing debris, carrying out flood mitigation work, as well as having enhanced winter maintenance and traffic control systems in place and personnel. Most of the emergency repairs are being led by our road and bridge maintenance contractors, uh, many of whom then subcontract where necessary to experienced Indigenous local and road builder contractors. Uh, when we do have final costs for all of the emergency work, we will, of course, update and share that with the public. I want to move briefly to rebuilds for our damaged infrastructure. The initial planning uh, to permanently rebuild highways 1 and 8 and the Coquihalla is well underway. In late November, about 300 representatives from various construction and design firms attended a virtual introductory uh, project meeting. We've since completed the assessments uh, of those firms and have identified those that have been included on the pre-qualified list for construction work. And we will be starting the reconstruction process as soon as con conditions allow uh, this spring. And we're excited. Uh, about the innovation, about the ideas, the expertise that these firms can bring. We know and we have seen uh, demonstrated in real time uh, in recent months um, that British Columbia has among the most talented workers and the best road construction firms that you can find anywhere in the world and they will be indispensable for us to rebuild permanently our infrastructure as we build it back better to where it was before the storms. The designs will incorporate construction techniques and practices and design specifications uh, to withstand uh, climate change and the impacts of extreme <coughs> weather events like we've experienced in our province. In closing, I uh, again want to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to all those who've gotten us to, the point that to this point, the companies involved, the trade unions, local First Nations, the engineers and suppliers. Your work has been noted and appreciated by British Columbians in every part of the region. Um, I can't thank you enough on behalf of my ministry, on behalf of Premier Horgan and the government. Um, I also want to take uh, a moment to acknowledge my staff in the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. They have been working around the clock as well for many, many weeks. Some of them didn't get much of a holiday break at all. Um, they've gone above and beyond and they've shown that uh, the public service here is dedicated to serving our citizens in the best way possible. And they've been out on the highways working with contractors, meeting with indigenous communities and local residents and leading and coordinating the response. And I can't thank these talented, hardworking professionals enough for the work they do. And I'm incredibly proud of what we've achieved thus far uh, based on their hard work and understanding that we have a lot of work left to do. And uh, we will be able to keep goods uh, and services moving in this province, repairing our supply chains making them strong and resilient uh, for the future. Uh, we will be working with communities to make that, uh, to accomplish that in the best way possible. And we acknowledge that that work continues to get us back to where we need before the storm conditions and build back better to where we've ever been as a province. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in for this briefing. Thank you very much. A reminder to reporters on the line, please press star one to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. Our first question today comes from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Hi, thanks. Uh, Minister, you said that 170 to 220 million dollars is for emergency repairs. Um, can you give me a sense of how much more work there needs to be done in terms of reconstruction? Yeah, so I, I mentioned, uh, thank you for the question, Justine. I mentioned that uh, those are the emergency repairs to restore temporary access and functionality um, to the highest degree possible on our highways. 
Um, we'll have to update those figures uh, over the next couple of months. There are obviously some outstanding invoices and work uh, progressing between now and the end of the fiscal year. When it comes to the uh, permanent uh, rebuild of uh, some of the uh, damaged areas, um, the, uh, the firms that are, we're working with as a ministry right now are coming up with design features and we haven't got that entirely costed uh, yet. Uh, we will share uh, preliminary project budgets for Highway 1, Highway 8 through the Fraser Canyon and the Coquihalla uh, when we have those, uh, those estimates completed. Justine, do you have a follow-up? I do, thanks. Um, can you give me a sense of the technical challenges? I know uh, weather notwithstanding, just like, how does this work compare to, say, the Sea to Sky or Kicking Horse Canyon upgrades? Well, you've got companies that need to um, work with uh, traffic control and uh, make sure that workplaces are safe to have the highways open and repaired at the same time. That's the goal, uh, to be able to use our highways as we build back better and repair them. Um, so there's, there's, there's a, that's always a, a major challenge in any construction project is, is how you manage uh, that access um, and functionality while you repair. So uh, it's it's significant. Um, obviously, some Thank areas we're going All to um, build back differently than what but was there before uh, in order to Please account for extreme weather call. events. We so that means that things will be possible. engineered uh, significantly differently than, than they were previously. So uh, we'll have those details to share as we identify solutions that we think meet the new engineering standards that we've helped develop with the industry and with some of the think tanks um, that are working on infrastructure resiliency in this province, in this country, and around the world. Next question, Richard Zussman, Global News. Minister, are you surprised by how quickly you were able to reopen this for regular traffic? I think when you were regularly briefing in November and December, there were some estimates that this may not be the case until the spring or summer. So are you surprised that this is happening so quickly? I am very pleasantly surprised at the progress that we made. Um, I think we had a, an opportunity for the entire province to express their uh, gratitude and uh, marvel at the work that was done on the Coquihalla to have it reopened to commercial traffic on the 20th of December. We had 300 incredible women and men uh, working on that job around the clock to be able to do that. I think we mobilized 140 pieces of equipment. Um, we had um, firms that were working with us. Let's put it this way. I think one of the things that really made the difference was the level of motivation was through the roof. People wanted to be a part of that. They wanted to show that uh, BC could rally uh, just as we helped uh, farmers and others that were affected by uh, flooding in Abbotsford, just as we donated to the Red Cross to help people out in Merritt and Princeton. It was really the same ethos of British Columbians and Canadians, in fact, uh, standing together to show what we could do. But uh, yes, the, uh, the technical progress and the skill and expertise that was displayed thus far in all the projects I've updated today and uh, before we had the holiday season upon us is nothing short of incredible. Richard, do you have a follow-up? To what Justine was asking about, are there any estimates in terms of the additional costs for building back? Like, I think people may be surprised to see that the number you present today is a bit lower than I think people were expecting for costs. And so should we expect the rebuild to sneak into the billions of dollars uh, in terms of costs? Yeah, it, it, it really wouldn't... Um be uh, productive for me to, to throw out a hypothetical number right now because there is a lot of work that needs to be done on quantifying what the rebuild looks like. Um, what we have done though uh, back in November as I mentioned uh, is we worked with uh, 300 firms and individuals who expressed interest in working on, uh, uh, on these projects uh, to sort of be able to pre-qualify them to get working as soon as possible once we get a, a good runway of, of better weather, as we get closer to the spring, um, we'll of course uh, have uh, you know a, a better idea of what the costs look like. Um, but as I've said before, uh, for us uh, making this a priority and uh, putting the resources that we need to into these emergency, unanticipated repairs is is what we're we're facing as a government and what we've committed to do. 
Next question, Alyssa Thibault, CTV. Hi, Minister. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, so, firstly, when, uh, when while Highway 5 had been closed and Highway 3 was really the only access point for a number of uh, vehicles to get to the interior, we did see a lot of uh, a lot of instances of crashes and avalanches and bad driving. I mean, do you, do you want to speak to that? Uh, and do you have any message to drivers taking the Coca Cola as well? I do, and um, certainly when the number three was the only route available to the interior other than the one that we were able to negotiate um, with our federal counterparts and the relevant U.S. agencies to get through northern Washington uh, for a period of time, uh, we sat down specifically on the number three with representatives of the trucking industry to identify how we can make this safer. Information was key. A lot of drivers had not been on the number three very very regularly or at all and needed to learn what the conditions were like. Uh, it's an older highway built to uh, specifications that are from uh, a, a previous era, uh, you know, so, uh, and, and it's difficult uh, terrain. Um, so I, I think with the enforcement, the RCMP presence, uh, we did hand out a number of tickets for people who, uh, for whatever reasons, weren't obeying the posted speed limits, so I think enforcement played a role in, in, in getting uh, stronger safety compliance, working with our road maintenance contractors as well to hit the weather with uh, de-icing and abrasives uh, and uh, keep it safe. Um, that was our goal. And uh, we certainly did everything we could to educate motorists that wanted to use it over the holiday season and when we reopened it uh, to them. So uh, the number three performed well. It was regularly inspected because we were worried about the damage it sustained, so making sure that um, it was um, functional at all times was, was part of that endeavour, and that's what we're doing now on the number five as well. Alyssa, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, and I guess just to, uh, leading on from that, because um, you mentioned there will be sections of the Coquihalla that will have reduced speed limits and, uh, and certain parts will take longer. Will there be, is there a plan of uh, enforcement on the number five? Yes, yeah, so you'll see similar stepped up enforcement that you've seen on the number three. So we're working with uh, RCMP and our own ministry uh, CVSE uh, enforcement teams. It means that when, um, when chaining up is required, chaining up must occur. When speed variables are adjusted, those need to be adhered to. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, absolute prohibition and restriction on any passing in the areas that have reduced lane capacity. So those are all things that uh, we're educating drivers about, that Drive BC alerts uh, drivers who are planning trips using the Coquihalla to be aware of. And uh, of course, it's what we're working with the BC Trucking Association and others to constantly remind uh, drivers of commercial vehicles uh, to adhere to. Next question comes from Mira Baines, CBC. Minister, uh, how do you respond to truckers who are worried about their lives because of the road conditions on BC highways? You know, they're complaining about ice, snow, and cold. There was a protest on the weekend, and uh, another one is planned for the upcoming weekend. Um, can you just respond to, you know, what do you say to those uh, truck drivers who are trying to cross these highways who say the conditions aren't, aren't good right now? Well, our number one priority as a ministry uh, is to make sure that all truckers are safe. Um, all workers in British Columbia deserve to uh, work safely and get home to their families uh, each and every night. Um, and that's what we're working on uh, on the Coquihalla. That's a key part of the um, road maintenance agreements that we amended and significantly changed in 2019. So there are significantly higher levels of resources to um, uh, make sure that uh, winter conditions are more regularly plowed and attended to in terms of de-icing, that more equipment is available on standby, that weather forecasting uh, plays a greater role in road maintenance uh, strategies and deployment. Uh, having said that, truckers are invaluable uh, eyes on the road for us. Um, you know, the issue that I heard uh, a representative of the West Coast Truckers Association talk about in terms of potholes, uh, we want to get crews repairing that damage because it's it's kind of like aftershock damage of the storm events you've got 
wet conditions under the roadbed that then freezes and cracks and we know that uh, those repairs are really important and uh, we have uh, companies and firms and supplies procured to be able to do that as quickly as possible that's that's the job that we're doing and um, uh, we've certainly uh, been working with road maintenance companies uh, because uh, the winter that we're experiencing right now is is significant and severe uh, you know uh, and uh, and therefore uh, working closely with the industry is a key strategy around uh, maintaining ongoing safety of our roads, including the Coquihalla. Nira, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, welcome back. To uh, yeah, I, and we're wondering about the federal the money clouds. that's going and towards these repairs and uh, uh, just the temporary about, repairs uh, the uh, as well as the permanent how repairs. The um, needs to be updated, do you have sort of a, a framework worked out with the Minister of, of Transportation, so uh, the federal uh, Minister of Transport? People. The pandemic well, has I've been in regular discussions with both the Minister of Transportation within, uh, and the Minister of Infra Canadian Infrastructure Healthcare federally, system. and, um, and uh, some of my counterparts in, in our BC cabinet are working, is, uh, for example, Minister Farnworth is working with Minister Blair and on uh, public British safety Columbia, and emergency recovery. That, the Minister of Agriculture uh, has been active with her counterpart uh, in Ottawa, so there are many facets to what recovery looks like, infrastructure damage in communities uh, because like Merritt and Princeton, uh, where it involves um, wastewater treatment and drinking water, uh, housing. And, so um, our discussions and the table we've to, created with our federal man, counterparts are really covering this every aspect board. of what uh, the recovery looks like. Jagme Singh is going to specifically to my ministry, uh, the discussions I've had with both situation. Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation federally around um, the situation what Build Back Ukraine Better looks like as, and what kind of flexibility we would like to see he will also answer with the money they've um, allocated Quebec on a preliminary basis for recovery um, imposing around a, uh, new standards, Building Back Better. Climate resilience has been very uh, productive, those who are and uh, the level of engagement uh, couldn't be any higher than than, than what we've achieved. Seemingly, um, as you listen, you'll question. find out we'll go to Tyler if he Olson, is for Fraser or Valley against Prince. such an action happening. And oh yeah, will he thank you. Um, there's like been some terms, as I think another reporter basis. raised, so um, let's listen to about the maintenance of highways the during the recent snow um, event. I think the ministry right. recently told Caston that that doesn't track the number of complaints about road clearing. If you don't track user feedback, how do you assess if those users are being served appropriately by the contractors? Well, we do, uh, and we have a very strict audit and compliance regime, and um, contractors are motivated financially to meet and exceed them. There's um, bonus payments that are not received uh, based on complaints that are investigated. So there is an investigation and an audit and compliance regime that is part of how the ministry uh, administers road maintenance contracts uh, in every part of the province. And uh, the other thing too is that I mentioned some changes we made as a province, as a new government, in fact, in 2019 around much higher standards of road maintenance and mobilization to uh, protect uh, uh, safe road conditions in the winter. Um, that cost a lot more money in the tens and tens of millions of dollars it added to the contracts that required them to staff up and acquire more equipment. Um, but that has paid off significantly. So we do, of course, track things like accident statistics, and we have seen uh, improvements related to the enhanced road maintenance contracts that our government uh, tendered and that were successfully competed for um, that is benefiting everybody in the province. Tyler, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thanks. Um, so rebuilding the highways is obviously a huge job, but are there any new plans for work on highway areas that maybe weren't damaged last year but may be particularly or newly vulnerable um, in the future given the last year and some of the weather we've seen and the, the fires we've seen? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're um, assessing vulnerability in every part of the province. We had some atmospheric river activity, some of which wasn't as severe as anticipated, but um, <coughs> you know, affecting the largely uh, unimpacted northern region. And then, of course, we had some weather events um, in the northwest of the province. So we're looking at those at, at that infrastructure. We have made some good steps in recent years in terms of the um, investments we're making 
uh, for climate adaptation, like proactive investments to prevent significant washouts and damage to infrastructure. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, it's very helpful now to be working side by side with the federal government as well. And um, there is some damage that was sustained in the storm events that we haven't talked a lot about in today's briefing um, because it was repaired so quickly and it's been so highly functional. But Highway 1, the Malahat here on Vancouver Island, uh, sustained significant damage in November. I, I drove it on Saturday and was very impressed with um, how uh, functional it is, how, how quickly those repairs uh, happen. But of course, there'll be work um, in upcoming construction seasons to see what additional steps we might take to uh, protect um, our drainage systems, to protect our highway networks. Thank you very much. That concludes today's event. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.